moving on to the next section. We have community leaders speak. And to help me uh, bring about this section, I would like to welcome Chelsea Zhang. She's an actress. Hello, everyone. It's so good to see everyone after such a great week of NCLF. My name is Chelsea Zhang again. Um, and as she said, I'm an actress out here in LA. You maybe have remembered me from the opening ceremony, but I'm so excited to be back to help introduce our closing ceremony keynote speakers. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, we're going to go and start with um, Lloyd Doggett. So US Representative Lloyd Doggett represents communities from San Antonio to Austin in Texas. He serves as the chairman of the Health Subcommittee on the House Ways and Means Committee. He is also a member of the Ways and Means Select Revenue Measures Subcommittee, the Joint Committee on Taxation, and the House Budget Committee. Prior to coming to Congress, Congressman Doggett served as justice to the Texas Supreme Court. Representative Doggett is also a strong supporter of the AAPI community and has received numerous awards for serving communities and protecting the interests interests of seniors and children. Save the Children recognized his leadership with the Congress Congressional Champion for Real and Lasting Change Award. AARP honored him twice with two awards, one for his leadership on Medicare and second for his efforts to preserve seniors access to health care. Representative Doggett's wife Libby recently served as a deputy Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy and Early Learning at the U.S. Department of Education. U.S. Department of Education. They have two daughters, Lisa, a physician, and Kathy, who leads teams across Texas that works with new disadvantaged parents. So without further ado, please welcome Representative Lloyd Doggett. Welcome, American patriots. Thank you for caring enough about our country to stay engaged, to stay informed, and to be doing all you can to protect our precious democracy in this upcoming election. I'm bringing you greetings from deep in the heart of Texas, where I can tell you that our Asian Texas community, our Asian Texans are the most dynamic, the most rapidly growing part of our state. And thanks to uh, the efforts of my friends of more than two decades, Victoria Lee and Alice Yee and so many others, Asian Texans are recognizing their political power. They're getting involved on boards and commissions. They're getting elected to the city councils, to the school boards, to the county commissions, to the Texas state legislature. And I'm pleased to say that I believe this year we will see two Asian Texans elected, at least two, uh, to the United States Congress with my very active support. I wanna thank you for your personal encouragement to me. The award that I was presented last year meant so very much as does the continued engagement. Well, my name is, is Doggett, and you would have be certain that I was born in the year of the dog, the fire dog, to be specific. As the Zodiac indicates, I've been well suited to public service, and in Washington, I've never been short of raging fires. I will say, though, that uh, it's the year of the dog. I am not definitely not the best friend of the man in the White House. As the Health Subcommittee Chair, I have been particularly concerned about this worst health care crisis in over a century in this country. It did not have to be this way. So many lives have been lost because of denial, delay, and ongoing deception. Thanks to the many Asian Americans who dug into their own pockets to pay for and obtain personal protective equipment, especially face mask. This week, we heard from the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, who testified before Congress that wearing a face mask, mask may be even more protective against the virus than getting a vaccine. The information we received at the same time was that the Postal Service back in April had on order 650 million free masks for everyone in this country. But those masks were never sent because they did not uh, conform with the president's theory that a miracle was just around the corner and the virus would disappear. Think of all the lives lost 
because of that failure of national leadership and all the small businesses that are out there struggling today to survive, some of them never to reopen, the families that have lost a breadwinner, who are struggling wondering how they will pay next month's car payment or credit card bill or the rent or their mortgage. All of this could have been avoided. We've had repeated false claims about the China flu, about the virus, the Kung flu, and we know who uses these terms. I think it's not uh, just prejudice and bigotry, though that's very real, but as a major way to deflect attention from the many failures of this administration. But they have clearly had consequences, direct harm to some of our neighbors, more hate crimes, greater amounts of bigotry, this is the danger that we face going forward. And that's why I was pleased to be a sponsor under the leadership of my friends, Grace Ming and Judy Chu of our resolution adopted in the House this week, condemning all forms of anti-Asian sentiment. With so much hate speech these days, I think it's important to remember that the first attempt to build a physical barrier, a border wall, uh, came in Texas over a hundred years ago. The demand then was to build a wall between El Paso and Ciudad Juarez to keep out Chinese immigrants. They would steal American jobs, it was claimed, and traffic opium. Instead, of course, those immigrants who did come brought entrepreneurship, strong family values, respecting elders, and a willingness to work very hard at often the most difficult jobs much as an earlier generation of Asian American immigrants uh, built the railroads that united our country. Fear of those with differing appearance or language or religion has unfortunately been a recurring theme in America since our very origin. The Chinese Exclusion Act, the Japanese internment camps, and before either back in the 1840s, the Know Nothing Party whose native-born male Protestants oppose voting rights even for Catholic immigrants. I believe that America prospers when we reject such bigotry and xenophobia. American democracy through the decades has worked best when there has been a true competition of ideas between two strong political parties. When Americans can discuss and debate and disagree without being completely disagreeable. But that system has been greatly weakened in the last three to four years. For the first time in American history, the recent Republican National Convention did not adopt any party platform or set of governing principles, probably because they were just totally uncertain as to what this erratic president would do next. Traditionally, the Republican Party has stood for more international trade, not more allegedly easily winnable trade wars. It's emphasized fiscal responsibility and avoiding government debt, not led by someone who claims to be the king of debt, as is true today. Republicans once stood for strong law enforcement, not attacks on the Federal Bureau of Investigation and our intelligence agencies, allegedly controlled by some mythical deep state. And they once recognized how important it was to stand up to Russia, but now we have a leader who uh, has attacked most everyone else in the world, but has nothing but good things to say about Vladimir Putin, despite his aggressive nature. Nowhere will we see these issues drawn more clearly than among those courageous Republicans who formed the Lincoln Project. I encourage you to turn to their website and see what they've got to say. What would another term with President Trump look like? Well, I suggest if you have any relative or friend who has lived in Malaysia or Vietnam or Cambodia or even the PRC, you can get a pretty good idea. And we already have some strong and alarming clues. This week, the Attorney General called for using the Sedition Act against opponents. Trump has labeled people like me and my colleagues who didn't clap long enough for him when he gave a speech He's called us traitors. And instead of affirming the essential value of the free press in a free and open society, 
He's used Stalin's term, enemy of the people, to, to describe reporters. He praises those who use violence against their opponents. And we just learned that federal officials actually contemplating the use of some kind of heat ray to remove peaceful protesters from the park across the street from the White House. The blame game will continue, claiming that immigrants are responsible for just about every shortcoming or failure in our country. And this will apply not just to those who enter illegally, but those who legally seek to become a student in America, who want to work for a high tech company or a healthcare provider. It's not just about blocking those who may have crossed the border improperly, but it's about people who want to reunite with a spouse, a parent, a child. The anti-immigrant hysteria that is fanned by people like Stephen Miller and other ideologues knows no bounds. The, uh, the blame game, we have to put a stop to that. I think that despite the multiple viruses that infect our country, COVID-19, racism, Trumpism, I overall still remain hopeful about our country's future because so many individuals like you are getting engaged and making a difference. So many of us are doing all we can to prevent a continued march on the path toward tyranny. As your conference once again unites the rich diversity of cultures that originate in the giant continent of Asia. Let's all unite to ensure that everyone is counted this month before the end of the month, that we begin to vote safely by mail as it can already be done in some states and commit now to do more than just voting this year, but having a plan to reach out and get others who've never thought that their participation made any real difference to get them involved because this year it truly does. In this most critical election in recent American history, the future of our democracy is on the line. It's on the ballot. Economic recovery and opportunity are on the ballot. More Asian American candidates are on the ballot. All America will be stronger when we truly leave no Asian American behind. Thanks so much. All right, that was a great message from Representative Lloyd Doggett. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Um, next up, I'm super excited to introduce Carol Moon Goldberg, who is the president of the League of Women Voters in California. Um, serving at both the local and state levels, Carol has been a member of the League of Women Voters, LWVC, for over 25 years, and for the past four years has served as their voter service director as well. In addition to overseeing production of standard voter service materials, she curated and wrote, and wrote content for Voters Edge and coordinated the league's part in the televised programs, including the U.S. Senatorial Candidate Forum. Prior to joining the state board, Carol served as a program director for LWVC in the Reproductive Choices portfolio for three years. During that time, she represented the league in a coalition of organizations working on related issues, analyzing and following legislation on the issue. After practicing law for a time, Carol retired in favor of raising her two kids and managed to take her, make a career out of volunteering. She served on the Sacramento County Grand Jury and remains involved with the system. She's very active in her children's school by serving on parent advisory committees and supporting various extracurricular activities of her children, organizing, fundraising, and chauffeuring them around. She has been married for 34 years to a very supportive spouse who also product practices law in Sacramento and volunteers for several nonprofit organizations. Now it's very important to remember that 2020 is the centennial anniversary of women's suffrage and a very historical election year. So we are so excited and it is so fitting that we have Carol here to share her passions and thoughts with the AAPI community and to remind us why representation matters and why AAPI votes matter. So let's hear some remarks from the lovely Carol, Carol Goldberg, sorry. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I, um, I appreciate the invitation to speak to you all. I am honored that you're interested in my organization. And so I thank you. Um, let me start by quoting 
a suffragist from New Zealand. Um, New Zealand actually allowed women to vote in all elections 25 years before America did. And um, this quote from Kate Shepard of New Zealand said, do not think your single vote does not matter. The rain that refreshes the parched ground is made up of single drops. Being here in California with our dryness, that, that resonates in a lot of different ways, um, but it is our message and has been our message for a hundred years. A single vote does matter. Don't ever believe that it doesn't. And really um, saying things like, do not think your single vote does not matter is part of another form of expressing the power of we, because we are the single raindrops that nourish the parched ground. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that has fought since 1920 to improve our government and engage all people in the decisions that impact their lives. The roots of the League of Women Voters lie deep in the women's suffrage movement, as Chelsea told you. It was founded by Carrie Chapman Catt, who was then president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And it was actually founded six months before the 19th Amendment was ratified. Um, that shows you how confident they were that this goal would finally be achieved. Please don't. Okay, I think that she's just having a couple of technical difficulties. So we have compiled a really nice trailer video for you of some highlights from this past week. So I think that we can roll that. This event is jointly hosted by um, AAUC and CLUSA. The sponsor of AAUC, the theme is diversity, compassion, empowering, and really striving for the future. Um, the spirit that brought everyone here together, I was reflecting a little bit upon my own experience growing up in the country, which is distinct yet similar, so I think, to Asian Pacific Americans who have con contributed to it, changing the land for the better. Asian Pacific Islander American. We're all Americans. We're all trying to help our country, to help each of us be a part of uh, our Governor Larry Hogan. This conference, as you know, is going to include some powerful keynote speakers, a lot of fun, very informative workshops, a exhibitor hall.
Fantastic. We actually took care of some of the te uh, technical difficulties. So I'd like to introduce Chelsea again to wrap up this uh, section. Chelsea, are you there with us? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you so much. Yes, we're so happy we have Carol back with us. So I'm going to go ahead and welcome her back to the screen so she can finish her lovely message. Here's Carol. Hi, everyone. I apologize. I have no idea what happens, but that's true of technology and me anyway. So I apologize. I just wanted to give you a quick history of um, the League of Women Voters and the suffragist movement. Um, as I said, it, it wasn't quite so easy as ladies um, had parades in white dresses and, and men said, oh, we see your point and of course you can vote. Um, it really didn't work that way. It took 72 years of organizing, letter writing, um, making dinners, speechifying, moving across the state and across the country. Um, there was dissension sometimes among the ranks of the women who some felt wanted to do a state by state campaign and some felt that they should go directly at the federal government to get something like the 19th Amendment. Um, and it wasn't easy. Those parades weren't so easy. The famous one in 1913 um, ended up with women being assaulted both verbally and physically um, and by the men in the crowd and other people in the crowd. Um, the uh, a little connectivity issues, but we're going to go ahead and um, keep going with our programming. We are so thankful that Carol even had time to talk with us. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Amrita, who's going to take us home. So. Thank you, Chelsea. I know it's never easy when we start to have some technical difficulties, but thank you once again for our guests for being available with us on a Sunday. And to help me wrap up this section, I would like to introduce Dr. S.K. Lowe. She is the president of AAUC as well as the chair of the 2020 NCLF. Uh, to our honored guests and our uh, respected uh, you know, speakers, uh, we are very thankful that you can join us today at our closing ceremony for the 2020 NCLF. Um, I want to apologize for a lot of technical difficulties we are having today uh, with the broadcast and then there was uh, some delay in the start. Um, my name is uh, SK Lo and I'm the president of AAUC and the chair of this year's forum. Um, we are very fortunate to have a lot of people who can help us with this event. We are very fortunate today uh, to be here uh, with the help of a lot of uh, staff and, and all the supporting uh, people who are behind the scene. Um, we are actually um, have people that are made out of uh, two of our volunteer teams, the NCLF, which stands for our National Civic Leadership Forum. Uh, our team is uh, Asian American Unity Coalition, we call ourselves AAUC, and then also the Civic Leadership USA. So we are here uh, very uh, glad that uh, we will be able to see um, there are more than that many people involved. We have actually a team of uh, 22 co-hosts who are putting together the forum and everything for us. Um, we also have three professional teams helping us to deliver, to put the content and manage the event for us. Uh, out of that, the 24 organizer, and we have 10 different individuals and group performers plus there are 20 session leads and 160 more speakers and 100 and 600 registered guests. So we actually have a large group and those all together uh, we have shown that 750 attendees are here. The ownership of this forum is actually belongs to everyone who participated. Um, let's go back to what we have said we're going to do. So this session that we have, we are finally at our finish line after nine days of marathon of learning from our community leaders around the country and benefiting from their wisdom. We have learned that we are actually sticking through our theme of Asian American unity 
and through that we see that there's a power of we. Um, so these are the purpose and the goal of our conference. Uh, we have achieved, uh, provided an open forum for all API communities and allies to network and collaborate and to learn and empower each other uh, to build trust and solidarity and to achieve our American dream. So looking back, this work has just begun and there's a long way for us to get to our goal. So we actually organized a, um, our theme, our whole event under the power of we. So we have learned through this that firsthand we are we are diverse and we are compassionate. Uh, we are empowered and we are the future for this multi-fabric um, of uh, culture in this USA. So what have we learned also? There's some interesting facts that we can give about this conference that we are doing. So here we have, um, looking at that, as I mentioned, we have a registered list of about 600 guests and the speakers, we have 160 and more. Uh, exhibitors, we have 50 and sponsor together, we have 24. Our age group uh, who participated in as a registered guest, uh, those who are under uh, 25 are like 19%. The 26 to 40 year old are 24% of our guests and 41 to 55 year old are about 31% of our guests and the rest would be the 24% of the 55 plus year old. So as far as our ethnicity goes, we are more diverse than we had before. We have over 19 some ethnicity um, that are joining us. Uh, we have more females than male connecting with us. And uh, we have altogether 27 learning sessions and eight uh, cultural performances in here. So what are the takeaways from this event? Um, we learned that Hoover is a very powerful tool, but it's so new to many people that everybody was expecting a direct link to the sessions, which doesn't happen, and they have to download the application and then go into it uh, through the front door and navigate what session is available at that time. And I think what we, our philosophy of being an open forum, a bottom up grassroots approach really works for us. Because without that, we would not be able to get the diversity we're looking for, the broad spectrum and age and gender, and also as well as race um, that are our attendees and our speakers. The topics we have are really, really impressive to me. We have the breadth and depth, and they are very current and also looking at future uh, events and issues. For the community, we feel we have created a very collaborative environment for people to work together. Um, and I'm very pleased with the delivery, which are of high quality, except for some technical glitches here and there. One of the disappointment is that we see uh, the numbers that are participating in real time is very low, but we expect that to be better as we are able to deliver these recorded sessions in later time. So we have about 30 some live presentations that are recorded, which is accessible through Hoover until the forum is taken down. Now the forum somehow, even last year's forum is still up in Hoover. So I would expect that this um, 2020 National Civic Leadership Forum will be staying on for a long time. So if you are registered guests, you can always come back and watch what is in there. But if you are not, those sessions are all archives in both of our websites, the CLUSA website, as well as the AAUC website. 
Um, during this event, we see that they are over almost close to uh, over 200, uh, 2,800 messages being communicated between everybody. And we have 56 posts on the community board. Um, 166 picture taken and people are creating meetups. There are nine of them and I attended a few myself. So I like to kind of recap what we wish for the outcome and want to see that we indeed, we have developed a deeper understanding of our diverse and compassionate community. And we have established more collaborative opportunity to build trust. And we are one step closer to building our AAPI unity, even if this is only a baby step. So we feel that with our bigger commitment in civic engagement, we would be have a greater impact in 2020 and beyond. So from this, I would like to ask several, all of us that we continue to visit Hoover for all the missed sessions that we have um, missed over the past events and also visit the exhibition hall where all the 50 um, organizations and businesses are there, go visit with them because the session, um, the Hoover will still be up for a long time to come. Bit on the auction items, they are really at a bargain and really don't want you to miss those. So we extended the auction until the end of this month because this month we are so busy with trying to get a catch up with all the sessions and everything. So it becomes very busy for us. So we like to have you kind of come back and visit and also bid on the auction. It's called the 2232 auctions. Uh, go into there, set up your bid, and then be able to participate. You will get a lot of bargain from that. So keep up with your established contacts too. We like you to know the people that you have meet up with and then try to keep up with them and establish further opportunities to collaborate together. And lastly, I like you to join AAUC and be part of our volunteer team for the 2020, 2021 next year's National Civic Leadership Forum. With that, I would like to turn over the forum um, to Amrita, who introduced the press conference. Um, and then she will be talking about um, uh, who are the, the team of the partners that we are here for our press. Thank you very much for joining us. And we are moving into the fourth segment now of our event. Thank you. 